Okay. Uh, first off, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. And um, I have everybody on mute uh, just because with these Zoom meetings, uh, sometimes we get background noise with kids talking, dogs barking, dishes um, clanking in the kitchen. And uh, so just to eliminate those distractions, um, I have everybody on mute. And at the end of the slide deck, we will um, give you the option to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question verbally. I, I realize this is one of the limitations of these online meetings is that uh, it limits interaction uh, when you have everybody on mute to, to eliminate the distraction. Um, so if you have questions uh, or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, please do keep the chat friendly. This is about biking and it's fun and we all have opinions. Um, and uh, I will get to any questions at the end, or you can just ask questions at the end verbally. I will give, I will turn off the switch that has everybody automatically muted and you can unmute yourself. So my name's Rich Conroy. I'm the Director of Education at Bike New York. And um, tonight's topic is how to uh, go about buying a bike. So uh, what are my qualifications to teach this? Um, I used to work in a bike shop for one. I worked in Metro Bicycles, which was a local chain, which then got sold to Danny's. And most of those shops are now Trek bike shops, uh, Trek the big bike manufacturer. Um, and you know, one thing I noticed when, when I got better at being a bike salesperson was people, would, a lot of people would come in and just have no idea to begin with. Uh, just like they'd walk in and ask me, what kind of bike should I buy? And since we didn't know each other, I would have no idea to that, to how to answer that question. So a lot of uh, being a bike salesperson was doing customer education. Um, and then um, over the years, I've bought and sold a lot of my own personal bikes, so many that I've completely lost track. My apartment is um, kind of a bike shop, and I own a lot of bikes, so much so that it's kind of a joke among my coworkers. Um, so before we move on, uh, and one more thing I'll say about that is most of the time I've enjoyed that and had good, uh, good choices, uh, but I have made a couple of mistakes along the way in terms of getting the wrong size or confusing apples with oranges in terms of uh, things like frame design and frame measurements on a bike. So a little bit about Bike New York. Uh, many of you may know us very well or have ridden in our five borough bike tour, which is what we're known the best for. We are a local New York City-based nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote biking and to get more people on more bikes more of the time and feeling good about it. And the whole purpose behind this, this class is to help people feel good about buying a bike, to feel good about maybe going online or walking into a bike shop with at least some sort of a knowledge base. Um, our education program, I see this number is kind of outdated, um, has reached uh, in the last four years at least 24 to 30,000 people per year with classes like this, on bike classes and on bike programming. And when I use that number, say 24,000, it isn't just handing out an information card to someone, it's an hour or two or more of contact with New York City's. Uh, young and beginning cyclists. And our education program is best known for uh, our Learn to Ride program, which teaches people how to ride a bike for the first time. Um, we do a variety of other things, including bike advocacy at the local city, uh, city, state, and national level. 
Uh, we have a number of community rides and I was just looking at our events calendar for this year and our events department has a lot of local, great local rides lined up. So you might wanna look at our events page on our website. Um, we have a membership program. Um, as with everybody else, it's been kind of a tough year. Uh, all three of my staff were laid off uh, last May because uh, the Five Bro Bike Tour, our biggest fundraiser got canceled. And um, so that kind of put a pinch on our finances. Um, so if you did learn a lot from this class at the end of it, um, we invite you to become a member, to join one of our local community rides, or to make a donation through our website. And I think I have the wrong slide deck. Pardon me, I updated this today. Let us try this again. I have added more buttons on the bottom of this Zoom uh, <laughs> Zoom thing. All right. Here, try this slide deck. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, I, I think buying a bike is fun, but I understand why some people would not find it so fun. Um, people ask, what's the difference between Trek and Specialized and Janus and Giant and Cannondale? Uh, there's a lot of different companies to choose from. There's at least three drivetrain, the, the crank shifters, derailers on a bike three major manufacturers that bikes are equipped with. So when you go look at a bike company's website, like why is this bike SRAM and the other bike is Shimano and what's the difference? There's a huge amount of new technology. Um, the, the bike industry is changing a lot. Some of that I think is improvement and some of that is selling new stuff to customers, uh, returning customers and new ones. Uh, but that can be confusing. Like, I don't know how many bottom bracket crank bearing standards there need to be. Um, there used to be just two, basically. And now there's, uh, seems like there's a couple of dozen. Uh, there's a number of frame materials that you have to choose from. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And... Um, you have a lot of different wheel sizes. It used to be when you were buying a mountain bike, you could buy any mountain bike you wanted as long as it had a 26 inch wheel. And now there are three different choices you have for mountain bikes. Um, folding bikes have two or three or four different wheel sizes for you. So I can get why people find this intimidating. There's a lot of choices, a lot of terminology and a lot of language to learn. What I would recommend is uh, if you're looking at a particular bike shop or bike brand, go to the shop and pick up the paper catalog for that brand if they have one and read through the technology parts um, so that you get a sense of what they're talking about. Or go on their website. If you're looking at a mountain bike, the website will often say the same exact things as the catalog, the printed catalog. And you, you read enough of this stuff, you get kind of educated as to what they're referring to uh, when they talk about travel on a dual suspension mountain bike. And they aren't talking about putting your bike on an airplane. So we're going to talk about uh, some different options you have about where to buy a bike, some key questions you should ask yourself about your, your choices and, and what you're looking for. We will kind of have a typology of bikes, uh, at least a rough, rough and ready one. And then we'll have a little bit of a component and frame primer 
we will talk about things like bike fit, bike comfort. Um, I don't have a section in this slide deck on buying kids bikes, um, which we generally don't get to that anyway. Okay, let's talk about your choices of places to shop. So the most obvious choice is your local bike shop. And they have a lot of advantages, in, mainly in terms of knowledgeable staff, uh, better quality bikes than you will find, say, um, at big box stores, which we'll talk about in a minute or two. Uh, a bike shop is going to give you better, better follow-up service. Like the bike will be assembled correctly in the first place. And most shops give you uh, a package deal of one year to three years. So sometimes even the lifetime of your ownership of the bike worth of adjustments, which is a nice deal. If your gear shifting isn't working right, your brakes are getting a little spongy, or you need some air in your tires, or maybe your seat has slipped down a little bit, you can take it in and that's what adjustments mean. It means uh, making little tweaks to the bike so that it works and fits better, uh, but it doesn't mean replacing worn or broken parts. Um, now, bike shops do have their downsides. For some people who are on a tight budget, even the entry level bikes at a bike shop 400, 300 bucks is too much for their wallet. Um, I used to work in a bike shop. There's a lot of all male staff shops who, you know, and I've seen it happen where the male sales staff just are not good at answering questions or relating to women customers very well. Um, I've seen shop staff when a customer comes in and says, I have $1,000 to spend on a road bike, then says, okay, you should spend $1,200 on this bike, and the customer walks out the door. So you wanna make sure with a shop that you get a good vibe, a good response from them, uh, that you know, they're treating you like a good customer that wants you to spend your money, your hard earned money there and not somewhere else. Now, there's an increasing number of online options for buying a bike. And the, the big player on the block is a company called Bikes Direct. And I want to say I've purchased one bike from them. Um, a Fat Mountain bike, a very nice bike. Uh, some of their entry level bikes are kind of cheap, uh, on the cheap end, but their uh, middle of the road to higher end bikes are very nice bikes, as every bit as nice as you'll get at a bike shop. Um, other big players are um, REI. There's an REI in Manhattan. There are other REIs in the area. They sell a number of brands, including their own house brand. Um, Jensen USA, Cambria Bike, Bike Nash Bar, Performance Bicycle, um, are also big players in uh, online bike sales. And now some of the bike manufacturers are getting heavily involved in online sales. I believe Trek is, uh, Kona, uh, Raleigh has gone, in, gone to a heavily online presence as I think their bike shop presence is, is reduced. Uh, Schwinn, and Mongoose have gone to uh, a heavy online presence. Uh, so the, the virtue of online sales is it gives you access to maybe types of bikes or bikes that you can't get from your local bike shop, or maybe you don't have a bike shop near you at all. Uh, of course, in New York City you do, but other places maybe not. There are a number of bikes I bought online that are just like, they're so specialty that, uh, you know, my local bike shop just isn't going to carry that kind of stuff. Now, if you are buying a bike online, you do kind of need to know what you're doing. Um, do your homework. Some online companies have very good online help. Um, 
I've ordered a couple of bikes from a Michigan company called Aventuron that I don't have listed here. And they're very quick on their customer service chat and, and very responsive. Um, but when, you're, when I say you're on your own, like one thing you're really gonna need to know uh, and, and have your act together on is the bike sizing and fitting to make sure you get the correct size. Uh, there is some assembly when a bike comes. Now, if you're ordering from a bike company like Trek or Specialized, or Kona, they might send it as their requirement to the nearest dealer, uh, the nearest shop of theirs that would then assemble it for you, uh, maybe with or without a fee. And of course, you might have to factor in shipping costs. I think Bikes Direct ships their bikes for free, but not all bike, not all companies are going to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now, there's the used bike option, and uh, there's a lot of good reasons to go for a used bike. I've bought lots of used bikes and used frames over the years. Uh, we have a shop in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, and it's on our website. It's called Recycle Bicycle, and we take donated bikes. We have mechanics that we often trained. Uh, to refurbish those bikes and we resell them and it helps fund our programs, particularly our recycle bike programs. Um, a lot of people buy used bikes because they can't afford a new one. There are lots of decent used bikes that aren't you, you know, aren't heavily used or damaged or worn out for sale on the internet. Um, if you live in a high theft area and you have no choice but to leave your bike locked up all day long. One good reason to buy kind of a cosmetically ugly but otherwise functional bike is that maybe that bike will be less attractive to somebody who's looking to steal bikes. Um, so that's one reason as well as affordability or maybe there's an old school bike that you just really like um, that you can't buy new anymore. I like to look for old school Trek mountain bikes. They're really good bikes. They're versatile. I bought one for my daughter, so she has a bike to run around on. And you just can't buy those, those types of bikes at that quality with those materials these days. Again, with used bikes, you do have to know what you're doing. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the challenges. Now, my old version of this slide deck was kind of like down on a negative about buying a bike from a big box store. And uh, you can buy bikes online from these, these companies. Um, the main reason why you would do that is uh, one, you're buying a bike for a kid. Their kids' bikes are just fine. Uh, they'll be less expensive, but pretty much the same quality as a single speed coaster brake, kids Trek or kids Specialized or kids Jameis. They're almost identical. The other reason is that people are just priced out of the bike shops and they want a new bike that they aren't going to use all that much. Now the downside here is for adult bikes, oftentimes they're dealing with companies the manufacturers that only manufacture one frame size for an adult. Now, of course, you wouldn't go to a Target and buy shirts and shoes um, and pants that way, but for some reason they sell bikes that way in, in adult sizes. Sometimes the assembly can be a little bit sketchy. I've seen customers walk out of Sports Authority, which is now a dead company, with handlebars uh, backwards or brake levers on upside down. Um, and then if there is a problem like that, the staff at these big box stores really, there's nobody there who knows how to work on or solve a problem with the bike the way you're gonna get with a bike shop. And then these bikes tend to be, um, I see I have extremely misspelled, that's extremely wrong. These, these bikes can be pretty heavy. Um, they're 
built with heavy materials with the least expensive parts on them. And they, they tend to be pretty heavy. Uh, but that said, if you are buying a kid's bike, that's just fine. If you have only 150, 200 bucks and not 400, then this bike will do just fine. Especially if you take care of it, like leaving one of these bikes outside where it gets rusty, gets rained on, um, it, it really makes these bikes kind of disastrous. So um, if you take good care of it, keep the tires pumped up, keep the chain lubed, don't leave it out in the rain indefinitely, these bikes will, will serve you pretty well. Okay, so uh, the, the main thing, I think the key ingredient to being, you know, buying yourself the right bike is knowing what your own needs are and what your priorities are as a bicyclist and a customer or consumer of bikes. So you need to know yourself. And I think that'll help you if you walk into a bike shop so that you uh, maybe know what kind of questions to ask. <coughs> okay, so the first two obvious questions are, what kind of biking do I wanna do with this bike or what do I wanna do with it? And what can I afford? Um, Keep in mind the affordability part. Um, you should budget for some extras like a helmet, like a lock. Um, front and rear lights are pretty key items. Uh, some people want to add a cage and a water bottle or two of those onto their bike. Um, and if you want your bike to haul stuff, you might want, you, you're gonna have to buy a rack and, and panniers or a rack trunk or something to haul whatever you wanna haul. And uh, so all that stuff adds up, it can add up to easily another 100 to 200 bucks, depending on uh, what you're adding to your bike. Uh, now, some bikes are really designed to do one thing really, really well. I'm thinking of like a road racing bike um, or a triathlon bike. And they don't do other things very well at all. Like you're not gonna wanna haul your Thanksgiving groceries from the grocery store using a road racing bike. It just will not work very well to do that. Or do you want your bike to do a lot of things pretty well but doesn't do any one of those things super, super well. Um, so for example, uh, a hybrid bike, you can, you can go reasonably fast on those, but you're not gonna win a professional road race with it. You might want, not want to do a century with it, but it'll still do a lot of those things pretty well. Um, ask yourself, what is your parking and storage situation both at home and at work? Uh, how much do you want to spend? How long are you going to be leaving that bike locked up outside? That's, that, do you have to take your bike upstairs uh, using stairs or do you have an elevator? Uh, do you need to take your bike on mass transit, uh, such as the commuter railroads, the New York City subway? Do you want to fly with your bike on an airplane uh, to take it traveling with you? Um, now, everybody says comfort, style, weight, and speed are going to be important to them, but uh, sometimes those can be mutually exclusive categories that you get to pick two or three of them. You just can't have all of them. And then ask yourself, uh, is the area where you're going to be riding hilly? Because that's going to affect maybe what kind of a gear system your bike comes with. Now, these are just some of the questions you could ask. There's... Um, probably a lot of others that, that you might think of to ask yourself about what your needs are. Now, one of the shops I worked at, <clears throat> well, a few of them, you know, were pretty, pretty working class neighborhoods and people would come in and say, listen, I can get a bike at Kmart or Target for 89 bucks. What makes your bike so expensive? And the answer to that question is, as with anything, uh, you get what you pay for. 
excuse me. So mainly as bikes get more expensive, um, they get lighter. Making a bike lighter costs a lot of money because you have to buy more expensive materials and more expensive technology. Um, you will get components that are more sophisticated and uh, are better performing. So for example, an $800 mountain bike is going to have a very different suspension fork on it than say a $2,800 mountain bike. The suspension fork between those two bikes, the, the more expensive one's gonna be lighter with better materials, but it's also gonna have a lot more bells and whistles and sophisticated technology that you have to pay a very knowledgeable set of engineers to design and produce. Um, and then some bikes, especially in the city bike, commuting bike category might come with some additional bells and whistles that you would otherwise have to buy separately. So some commuting bikes or touring bikes may already come with a rack or may already come with fenders or uh, may already uh, be equipped with lights. A critical, critical thing about buying a bike is making sure that you get the size right. Now, the only thing where you may not have to worry about this so much is with a folding bike with, say, 16-inch or 20-inch wheels, where the frame size is going to be pretty much the same, and you just have to adjust the seat and handlebar. Um, so we're going to give you a few rules of thumb. And, and as a follow-up, we are going to send you some information about bike fitting and sizing from NYU Langone that has a whole department for uh, sports performance, uh, people who think about this stuff. So if you're looking at a bike website or a bike printed catalog from say Trek or Cannondale, um, each model of bike is going to come with a geometry chart. And there's a few things you're going to want to pay attention to in terms of fitting. The first part is the first thing is called the standover. And their listing of the standover is going to be the distance between the top of this top two and the ground. And let's say you're looking at a bike that uh, size medium has a standover of 30 inches. Now, let's say you know your inseam, which is the measurement from here to the floor, and your inseam is also 30 inches. Well, don't go out and buy that bike with a 30 inch standover, because that means your body right here is going to be touching this top two. Really what you need minimally is one to three inches of clearance of standover, uh, clearance between this standover measurement and your body. Now this can vary depending on what type of bike you're buying and how the frame is designed. Like some road racing bikes and road endurance bikes have what are called compact frames, uh, this, where the, this top tube slopes some. And uh, there you probably have maybe three to four inches of clearance. Or if you're buying a downhill mountain bike, which is made to jump off ledges, you're going to want even more clearance. So talk to your, if you're looking at a particular model of bike, talk to your bike shop about that standover height. Another measurement you're going to want to know is, well, let me just back up a little bit. So the standover height is the height from the top tube here to the ground with the wheels on. The frame size is the measurement from the center of this bottom bracket shell right here where your cranks are at to somewhere up in here and different companies measure it differently. Some of them measure it clear up to the top of this seat tube, which is called center to top, or some of them will measure it somewhere in here, center to center. And that can be a 
a, measure, a difference of one to two inches. So the, the frame sizes are what's listed here in terms of measurement, not the standover height. So if you're looking at a mountain bike that says 17 inches, that's this measurement right here and not this one. The 17 inch mountain bike may have a standover of say 32 inches, okay? Uh, this is the bike sizing right here, this measurement. Now, one other measurement that's important to look at is the distance between where your seat tube is at, the top of that, and the center of the head tube or the, the headset bearings right here at the front of the bike. As a bike gets taller for taller people, this measurement gets longer. Um, another measurement besides this measurement is what's called the reach. And the reach is when you have the stem, which is what connects the front part of the bike to the handlebar, that adds on a few more inches. So you're, you're reaching to the handlebar or even for a road racing bike to the brake hoods. So again, as a bike gets taller, that front stem gets longer and the reach gets longer. So your two body dimensions you need to know are the standover and the reach. If you already have a bike that you are comfortable with, physically comfortable with, uh, I would measure those two uh, in both centimeters and inches, uh, measure this part right here, but then also measure to the handlebar from the seat post, seat two, and take those numbers into a bike shop uh, when you're shopping and say, this is what I currently have and it fits me like a glove, or this is what I currently have and it's really uncomfortable. And then a little bit about riding position. Different types of bikes that we'll get into are going to give you a different riding position. And you might want to think about, you know, what's comfortable to you. Um, and I think the bike industry has you know, done a, a better job of giving people more choices in terms of their body position on a bike. And then comfort is, is also not just a product of the body position and um, the size of the bike or the design of the bike, but it's also like, how is that bike equipped? Um, and a lot of times that pertains to how, how is it, you know, what, what are the contact points of your body, mainly your rear end and your hands? Uh, how's the bike equipped for that? Uh, How's the bike equipped to handle bumpy or buzzy roads? Uh, does it have suspension? Does it have fatter or skinnier tires? Like for example, fatter tires are going to um, absorb road vibration and less smooth pavement than say a skinny road racing tire. Um, a big wide saddle like this might feel comfortable for short jaunts but you wouldn't don't want to do a cross country tour or probably a century with one of those. That this saddle, that's actually hard as a rock, may be designed to fit your pelvic bone better over the long run than this saddle is. Um, and keep in mind, all of these things have trade offs. Like if you have bump, bumpy and rough roads, uh, you know, maybe putting some suspension or buying a bike with some suspension, including rear suspension, is uh, going to make those roads feel a lot smoother to you. But that bike is also going to be heavier and more complicated. So those are kind of like some trade-offs that you get. All right, let's talk about some different types of bikes here. And I'll try to go through these pretty quickly and tell you what else is out there that you're not seeing, going to see on the screen. So in the 1970s, you could buy pretty much any type of bike you wanted as long as it was a road bike. And um, they are still very popular. 
And among the road bike categories, you're starting to see a lot of different subcategories. The commonality of road bikes is that they're going to have some sort of a drop handlebar like this. Most of them will have skinnier tires, but even now there's you're starting to see bikes, road style bikes at least, that can take much thicker, wider tires on them. So uh, here we have two different types of road bikes that at first appearance look very similar to each other. Uh, a racing bike is what it says it's for. It's for winning races. Uh, generally, they're going to be made out of carbon fiber. Um, you might find a few like super light aluminum bikes in the racing category, but they are for one thing only and they are for winning races. And they're going to give you a very aerodynamic position to cut the air resistance, because as you are going faster and faster, air resistance is your biggest uh, adversary, besides hills and the other people you're racing against. But not everybody wants to race. A lot of people want to go fast and want to have a, a comfortable, lightweight, fast bike. They just don't want to race and be in that racing uh, aerodynamic position. And that's where the endurance bikes come in. Now I'm saying to myself, hey, if you're racing, you're already into an, an endurance event. But what endurance bikes mean is that people, you know, people are maybe doing century rides, doing a multi-day fully supported bike tour, which is maybe 60, 70 miles a day. Um, they're doing maybe charity fundraiser rides where there's a lot of miles. But these aren't races. But still, people want something light, fast, and efficient. So the differences between these bikes might be slightly wider tires, a little more of an upright riding position in terms of how the frame is designed and maybe things like the, the stem uh, that they put on it. And then also the gearing. Uh, a racing bike is gonna have higher, faster gearing uh, that is not hill friendly for most people. Whereas these bikes are still gonna have pretty fast gearing, but they'll have better gears on the lower end for going up hills. Now, the neat thing that I think the bike world has going on is people have decided they don't want their road bikes to be one trick ponies. And so this is where the touring bike, which is a much older category dating back to even the 1930s, 1920s, but they were very popular in the 70s and 80s. And then they kind of fell out of popularity. So a touring bike, think of that as a pack mule or a cargo plane. It is for hauling stuff without being a cargo bike. Uh, I do a lot of um, self-supported bike touring and I have a couple of touring bikes that will take a front rack, and I'm sorry, a front rack and a rear rack. Um, this bike here is a Trek 520. Trek's been making that bike I don't know, 40 years or so, and they've updated the parts and the frame tubing and stuff. But um, you can go fast on them when you take the racks off, but you're just not going to win a race. Uh, the cool thing that this bike will do is it will haul your sleeping bag, your tent, uh, your clothes, your rain jacket, your camping stove, whatever you want to take with you, whereas that road racing and endurance bike is not going to haul that stuff very well. Now, the bike industry has come out with another category called gravel or adventure bikes. Um, and they're kind of a relative of the touring bike and they're a relative of another type of bike called a cyclocross bike that I don't have listed here. A cyclocross bike is really a racing bike that's meant to race off-road. So it has wider tires, lower gearing, but it's still meant to, to race. So the gravel adventure bike, they, they design these so that you can put even wider tires on them. You can still put on most of them that I've seen racks on both the front and the rear. And uh, one of the big differences that you're going to see with the gravel and adventure bikes though, is this touring bike has a triple crank. So it has three gears on the crank set, including a very low gear. 
and then it kind of has a normal cassette for like a hybrid or a mountain bike with maybe a lowest gear of 32 or 34 teeth. Now, if you look down here, you'll see this has a one speed crank and it's a pretty low gear on that crank. It's like a 34 tooth. Um, but then if you look at the back of the set, it's huge. It might be 46, 48. There's even cassettes back there with more than 50 teeth on them. And they have to build special derailers and stuff to accommodate that big of a cassette. So what that does, you know, it eliminates the need for left-hand shifter. It makes your gearing simpler up front. Uh, you just can't take a derailleur off of one of these bikes and slap it on here and think it's going to work. Let's talk a little bit about mountain bikes. Um, so this is only two very basic generic subcategories. There's trail bikes, there's downhill bikes, there's racing mountain bikes. Um, and there's a new category that's a lot of fun called fat bikes. If you want to ride in the snow or ride around on the beach or um, just do some regular mountain biking. But the two basic types here are a dual suspension which means you have a suspension fork in the front. And the frame is designed with a series of linkages and pivots and a shock somewhere, usually in here, but sometimes it's back here, depending on who designed it. So dual suspension, they, they aren't, you know, the, the suspension really isn't about comfort on rough trails, although that can help. It's really about keeping the mountain bike under control as you ride over rocks and tree roots and things like that. Um, the other more traditional type of mountain bike is what's called a hardtail, which means it has a rigid frame. There's no suspension back here. Um, most hardtails are going to come with a suspension fork though, kind of like this one. This picture is, this is a Kona, I believe, has a rigid fork. And it's getting really hard to find a completely unsuspended mountain bike. Uh, now, the kind of the cool thing about totally unsuspended mountain bikes is they are pretty versatile machines, especially if they have the rack attaching points on the fork um, and on the frame back here. Um, you can use them for touring uh, if you want a touring bike that gives you a more upright position. You can use them for commuting. Uh, I wouldn't want to maybe do a super long commute on one of these because the fatter tires are going to be heavier and slow you down. Now this is where I think things get a little confusing. <clears throat> and that is this category called street bikes, hybrid bikes, commuting bikes, city bikes, fitness bikes. As I was updating this presentation today, I looked on Jameis's website and Jameis is a local company, uh, own, woman owned. Uh, she lives here in New York City and their headquarters is right up near state line of New York, New Jersey, about 20 miles away. Anyway, looked on their website and you know, their road bike terminology was pretty simple. Their mountain bike typology was pretty simple. But when you got to their street bikes, pavement bikes, urban bikes, they had four different types. And I, I kind of think the bike industry is all over the place with these categories here. Uh, they call them different things. So uh, I'll try to try to keep this clear. And I've had shown two different types here. The first type is a hybrid. And the reason why they're called a hybrid is when the hybrid type was first designed, it was designed with kind of like a mountain bike type frame, which gives you an upright position, mountain bike geometry, mountain bike components, cranks, derailers, cassettes, the brakes and the brake levers and the shifters were all taken from the mountain bike world. Um, but the main difference is the wheel size is 700C, which is a standard road bike wheel size. 
except that the hybrids have room for fatter tires than a road bike. Um, so among hybrids, you're going to see different types. You might see some that have front suspension and they're called also called adventure bikes. Uh, you'll see some with really skinny tires and carbon fiber frames or high-end aluminum frames, high-end steel frames that are called fitness bikes that you can do a century on very, very well without having that road bike drop handlebar. Uh, some of these bikes are called commuting bikes and they may come with fenders, chain guards. They may have a totally different gear system where there's no derailleur and the gears an internal, internally geared hub. Uh, they may come with lights already. Uh, so there's a lot out there. If you're looking for a city bike, you're going to have a lot of choices, but also maybe as you go from one website to another, a lot of terminology and bike typology to sort through. Um, now, if you want a bike that's really simple, that doesn't have all these gears and gizmos on them, you might want to look at a single speed or a fixed gear. Now, the difference between a single speed and a fixed gear is a uh, single speed, will, you're able to coast. You can stop pedaling while the back wheel is rolling, but it has a little uh, freewheel mechanism. A fixed gear means that you have a cog back here, but it's fixed to the wheel. It doesn't freewheel at all. So that while that back wheel is moving, so are the pedals, and you can't stop pedaling as long as the bike is moving. Uh, fixed gears kind of became a fad uh, among, you know, a certain age of urban cyclists. Uh, but a lot of people do like big, uh, single speeds just for their simplicity. And it can be handy if you don't have a big steep hill to climb. Let me just do one quick thing here. Sorry about that, I need to turn the lights on. Now, of course, folding bikes are, are really popular and most folding bikes are gonna come with a small wheel size, um, 16 or 20 inch. Um, from there though, folding bikes get pretty, pretty diverse. Uh, some folding bikes like the Bike Friday, you can actually tour on. Um, there's another model of the Bike Friday that is meant for like an endurance road bike. It's meant for doing centuries and charity rides. Uh, you do have one company out there, Montague, that is making full-size folding bikes um, that are pretty nice bikes. They're pretty good quality. Uh, but most people are going for these small wheel bikes because they are better for fitting into an airplane, a commuter train, uh, that may not accept these full-size wheels without charging you a fee. Um, the pricier brands among folding bikes of this size are going to be like Brompton, a very popular brand in New York City. More affordable brands will be like Dahon and Turn that you can, you can find in bike shops. I would be very careful about buying folding bikes off of Amazon um, that you don't necessarily see as bike shop brands because a, there's a lot of junk being sold out there in the folding bike category. Um, for example, I purchased a Citizen, which is uh, online retailer only. I bought it used off the Craigslist and I was surprised at how bad it was. Uh, all the folding mechanisms on it were loose and they just didn't seem to be designed to last very long. Uh, the components on it were terrible and I had to basically put halfway decent components on it to make it rideable. So do be careful about buying randomly named folding bike brands online off of Amazon or other places, eBay also. Uh, if you want a full size bike that you want to travel with, there are a couple of different types out there that are called take apart bikes. In other words, the frame disassembles. So the one we feature here is Richie. And um, 
they manufacture their own bikes and I believe they've licensed their system out to one other company. Uh, but basically the, the idea here is you can fit your bike, wheels included, into an airline specified size of suitcase so that you don't get price gouged for taking a bike with you. The other system for take apart bikes is SNS machine. I know this looks like SANS machine, but they've designed a coupler that threads together. And mostly you have to have these couplers retrofitted onto either a steel or titanium frame. Um, but there, I think there are a few companies that will manufacture these bikes with SNS couplers installed. I know Surly was one company that offered one or two of their bikes with these. Uh, but anyway, if you go on SNS Machines website, it will give you a list of the companies that are manufacturing or able to retrofit an existing frame with these couplers. Uh, they do not work with aluminum, and I believe they do not work with carbon fiber. Uh, it's steel or titanium. And then finally, the e-bike. Um, if you're buying an e-bike, please uh, check your local laws in terms of what's legal and where it's legal. Uh, New York City has legalized certain categories of e-bikes. Um, and these are California regulatory categories. And I always get mixed up which is which. Uh, two of the categories you have to be pedaling to uh, activate the motor. And the third category, the most powerful one, you can just turn a throttle and it activates the motor without pedaling at all. Now, in my biased opinion, that is not a bicycle that's getting into motorcycle territory. Uh, this particular bike is um, actually just a standard issue bike with a kit retrofitted. So here's the rechargeable battery, and then the motor is in the hub, and they, or is the hub, and they build the wheel for you that fits your bike. And I believe they have three different wheel sizes. So you might want an e-bike if you have long hills to climb, uh, if you have very heavy loads like cargo loads, if you have long distances that you routinely have to travel with a bike. Um, a lot of people who um, maybe they're getting elderly or they have a physical condition that prevents them from just enjoying a standard bike. I am seeing a lot of people oh, just taking buying these things just because they don't want to pedal a regular bike. And my biases are that I prefer that able-bodied people who just have normal biking to do buy a human powered bike. But uh, there are good reasons for people to buy an e-bike. Um, just do be aware of the different technologies out there. Some are, um, the motors are in the hub, usually the back hub. Sometimes the motor is in behind the crank set. There's different battery technologies. There's different ways that this battery is stored on the bike. There's different power levels of batteries. Uh, there's different, what's, what's it called? How long the battery stays charged or how many miles it will give you before it needs to be recharged. So it's, it's a lot of technology to study if you are buying an e-bike. And then um, let's not forget about recumbents. I own a couple of these. Uh, if you want to go fast, recumbents can go very fast because they have a much more aerodynamic profile than even a road racing bike. However, they are not race legal. Um, they can also be very versatile, like this bike could be a good commuter. It could be a good long distance touring bike. It could be great for centuries and charity rides. Uh, the nice thing about recumbents is they are very comfortable. They're not putting pressure on the parts of your body that a normal bike um, applies. Uh, so really the weight of your body is being borne by your rear end, by your butt and your back that are better able to support weight. 
Um, so I, I liken it to riding your couch down the street um, at high speed. They're a lot of fun. I own a couple of them uh, in my bike fleet. Um, however, they are a specialty item and there's only a, a few companies that manufacture them. Um, an American company here is Baquetta. Uh, there's a couple of other American companies. Lanier is another one. Now, the only thing that's really, obviously the position's different and the frame is a totally different design. The seat is a totally different design and the handlebar is gonna be a totally different design. Pretty much everything else on these recumbent bikes, all the components, the wheels, the spokes, the cassette, the derailleurs, the shifters and the brakes, the bearings, they're all gonna be pretty much standard bike equipment that every other bike uses. All right, let's talk a little bit about frame materials. And I need to develop this section a little bit better, but these are your four main choices that you're going to see. Uh, the first three you'll see in bike shops. Uh, aluminum used to be very rare because uh, the military was using it so much. Uh, but now it's become the most common material. You'll see a lot of mountain bikes made out of aluminum, a lot of hybrids, and um, a lot of road bikes up to a certain point, road, mainly road endurance or road recreation bikes. Uh, the thing about aluminum has become less expensive. It is very light. The downside of aluminum is that it needs to be well designed for it to be comfortable. If they're just taking straight aluminum tubes and welding them together, uh, that thing's going to ride like a 1920s tractor with steel wheels. It's going to give a lot of road vibration and you're gonna feel like every bump is being transmitted up to your spine. But the bike industry has gotten a lot better with shaping and manipulating the tubing so that aluminum does not have this reputation. Uh, now, one of the downsides of aluminum is if the, if the frame breaks or cracks, it is do usually done. Uh, it's not considered a repairable material. And for that reason, it's not um, a choice that a lot of long distance self-supporting touring cyclists use if you want to go that route. <coughs> um, your other choice that you're going to see a lot in bike shops is carbon. Um, carbon bikes will probably start around maybe the 1400 uh, dollar range for a carbon mountain or a carbon road bike. And those will have not cheap components, but they won't have your highest end parts on it. Um, so carbon is really for uh, road racing bikes, uh, racing mountain bikes, uh, because it is light. It can be molded and manipulated in an infinite number of ways to give an infinite number of ride qualities to it. Um, it's really kind of taken over the high end of the bike industry, especially the racing end. If you were buying an endurance road bike, you can certainly, you'll have a lot of um, carbon choices at your disposal. And then there's steel. Now steel was kind of the traditional bike frame material. In fact, it was the only bike frame material up until the early 1990s. Um, you'd see a little bit of aluminum, a little bit of titanium, a little bit of carbon here and there, but steel was king. And now it's getting, it's gotten kind of hard to find a steel bike. Um, there aren't many manufacturers selling steel. Uh, I think Trek uh, their least expensive mountain bike is, is steel. The Trek 520 touring bike is steel. Uh, Jamus, a local company, has traditionally dealt with a lot of steel, as has Kona. Uh, but most of the manufacturers have really gone to carbon and aluminum. Um, it's gotten to the point with steel where you might actually have to go to like a, a custom frame builder to get the kind of steel frame that you want. Uh, now, the advantage of steel is it gives, it's affordable, good steel, 
can be uh, still very light, but not as light as carbon. Uh, it's very strong and it's much more easily repaired if something cracks or breaks it, with either TIG welding or brazing. If you were doing a bike tour and you're in Africa and your steel frame breaks, chances are there's a guy in some village welding shop who can repair that uh, broken frame. <coughs> I, I myself um, uh, really like uh, a good quality steel frame, steel bike. And then finally, there's titanium, uh, which is where the word unobtainium comes from, because titanium had and still has a reputation for um, you know, being really expensive. Now, uh, before carbon came along, titanium was considered your high-end fancy material. Uh, but there weren't a lot of companies working with it. So Le Monde, which doesn't exist anymore, worked a little bit with um, titanium, but it was really companies that were specializing in it, like Merlin, uh, which no longer exists, Seven, which does still exist, uh, and Linsky. Uh, there's a few other companies out there if you're looking for good titanium. You might have to find it on Craigslist or eBay used, like uh, Dean, uh, Lightspeed, uh, Airborne was another company that did some titanium. Um, the nice thing about titanium is that it doesn't corrode. It's every bit as strong as steel. Um, it's very lightweight and it makes a beautiful frame. You don't even have to paint the stuff. It's a naturally or can be a naturally shiny metal. Uh, but these days you're probably looking at kind of a, a semi-custom or a custom bike from Seven or Linsky if you wanna buy something new in titanium. Uh, there's another company that's a little more affordable than them out of like, Arizona called Habanero. Uh, my touring bike is a Habanero and you can buy frames uh, from that guy. They're even custom designed. All right, we're moving right along. I'm going to say a few things about different components that you might want to look at or different types of components that are out there. Um, first, different brake types. So um, let's start from the bottom here. These cantilever brakes, those are becoming scarce. Um, when hybrids first came out and uh, early mountain bikes up until say about 1990, they were all equipped with cantilever brakes, which have a separate pivot for each arm of the brake. And then there's a straddle cable that connects these two. And then the, that connects to the cable that goes up to the brake lever. Um, you can still find a few bikes equipped with these. Um, you can buy them aftermarket if you're building up a frame, but you're not going to see a lot of cantilever brakes out there. What you are going to see more and more of is the new kit on the block, and that is disc brakes. Um, even entry level bikes at, say, the three, four, five hundred dollar range from a bike shop, you're seeing uh, at least mechanical disc brakes. Mechanical disc brakes uses a regular brake lever and a regular brake cable to pull and activate the brake. Whereas a hydraulic disc brake, you have to have a hydraulic brake lever, a hydraulic hose, and a hydraulic caliper. Um, the hydraulic brakes are much more powerful than the mechanical ones. But let me just say the mechanical ones are pretty darn powerful, uh, way more powerful than these other three. The nice thing about uh, disc brakes is, one, they don't wear out your rim, which is not really a replaceable part. They wear out this rotor or they wear out the pads, and those are considered replaceable. Um, two, in wet, rainy conditions, your disc brakes will stop you much more quickly, whereas all of these other types of brakes have to wipe water off the rim before they can really be effective uh, to stop your bike. Now the caliper brakes, you're still seeing a lot of road bikes equipped with calipers. Um, the dual pivot calipers are pretty powerful. Um, 
and you might find a few like single speeds or uh, very, very high-end hybrids with caliper brakes. Uh, but more and more of the hybrids and the road bikes are being equipped with disc. One of the main disadvantages of caliper brakes is uh, you can't fit really fat wide tires around them, which is why they're kind of confined to road racing bikes and, and endurance bikes. Even the gravel bikes have been avoiding, gravel and adventure bikes have been avoiding these um, because you can, you don't have to worry about how fat your tire is with a disc brake. And then the V-brake is really kind of what replaced cantilevers on hybrids, touring bikes, and um, mountain bikes. And you'll see a lot of V-brakes still out there on hybrids and mountain bikes or city bikes. Um, they are more powerful than cantilever brakes. You do have to have a different brake lever because of V-brake, you have to pull more cable to activate the V-brake. Um, they're pretty good with mountain bikes. You do have more room for putting on fatter tires. Uh, but if you really want to go crazy with fat tires, again, you're looking at disc brakes. Um, but what, what I think I'm saying here, especially with V-brakes, you'll see these maybe on more affordable end of, of the bike range. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's talk a little bit about cranks and gearing. Now, as your bike gets bigger or taller, bigger sizes, the length of your crank is going to get longer. Um, but from there, your different type of cranks are going to depend on what you're trying to do with the bike. So pay attention to these numbers uh, when you're looking at the specs, because what they tell you is how many teeth are on the chain ring. A big number means a big chain ring, which is for going fast. And a really small number is a very low gear, say for climbing up uh, a very steep, rocky trail, you want some low gear, or hauling your heavy touring load up a hill. So a road racing crank is gonna have two chain rings, an outer and an inner, a big and a small, a high and a low. Uh, that's really meant for racing. And if you combine that with the racing cassette, 39 teeth as your low gear for most people isn't low enough to, um, I think I'm freezing here. There we go. It's not low enough to climb hills. But this road compact crank, it looks exactly the same but you'll notice the gearing is somewhat lower. And in particular, this 34 tooth chain ring gets in the territory that makes it easier or uh, makes people more able to climb, climb hills more easily. And then you'll have a road triple. These you'll often see on hybrids. You'll even see them on some mountain bikes, maybe not in this exact gear combination. It may be something like 42, 32, 22. This is more on the road end, whereas a 42, 32, 22 would be more on maybe a mountain bike end. Um, the mountain bike world is changing quite a bit with how it treats crank sets. So you're not seeing the triples quite as much as you used to. Um, you're still seeing a lot of doubles, but they're geared pretty low. Um, my fat bike, uh, mountain bike, has a crank set like this. But a lot of mountain bikes are just skipping to one chain ring and they're using a super wide range cassette in the back. Um, and that simplifies uh, the bike in terms of not having a front derailleur, not having these extra chain rings, not having a front shifter, uh, not having all that stuff that can break when you hit a rock with it. Um, also, the, a lot of the gravel and adventure bikes are going to a single speed 
or else a really compact two-speed crank system. Your hybrids, your entry-level mountain bikes are looking at these types of cranks. A road endurance bike will look at a either a road compact or sometimes a road triple. And that is going to affect what kind of gearing and cassette is on the back. So if you look at these, this is maybe not the best profile shot here, but some of these road racing <clears throat> uh, cassettes, I call them corn cobs. There's not much of a steep difference between your biggest cog here and your smallest one here. A more standard cassette for say hybrids, touring bikes, and a triple crank mountain bike will look more like this. And maybe your hardest, fastest gear will be you know, 12 teeth, 11 teeth, but it's really your easiest gear will get into like 32, 34 teeth. Um, a road endurance bike will be somewhere in between these two with maybe a, a biggest cog of say 28 teeth. Whereas here the biggest, the biggest cog may be 26, 24. It doesn't really give you an easy hill climbing gear. And, but where the bike industry has really gone crazy is with these wide range rear cassettes. It used to be that 32 or 36 teeth as your lowest gear was the biggest biggest thing out there. And now they're getting 42, 48, I think even into the 50s now. Again, you have to have a special derailleur that often is compatible only with a certain type of shifter to work with those. Uh, but what you're looking at when you kind of look at the bike's specifications is how many speeds does it have? In other words, how many cogs? And what's your low gear, which is gonna be for the cassette, the, the biggest number? And what is your high gear, which is gonna be the smallest ring here? Um, and that will tell you kind of what kind of bike and what kind of gearing you're getting. Okay, that is the end of our slide deck. I am going to momentarily stop the share. And I'm going to allow people to unmute yourselves. I, I can't unmute you, but um, let's open it up to questions and answers, any discussion. I'm going to take a look at the chat here. I'm replying to one of the questions with chat answer. The Habanero, as in the hot chili pepper, um, their website is, I believe, habcycles.com. But if you just Google Habanero bicycle or Habanero bike, you'll get to his website. Okay, so Victoria asks, and this is a good question, is a hybrid bike best at hauling stuff like groceries? Uh, I'm gonna say most hybrid bikes are going to be very, very good at hauling stuff because they will come with the same rack attaching points um, as say a touring bike, uh, but that's what you want to look for. And let's see if I can find a picture. They're, they're called brazons from the old steel frames where these attaching points were brazed into or brazed onto the frame. Um, but most hybrids do come with those and which allows you to mount a rack. Um, and so yeah, they're, they're great at hauling stuff. And they, they also have a wheelbase that's longer 
so that when you put, say, panniers that hang down on the side of the rack, your heel is probably not going to hit the panniers as you're trying to pedal, which is why a road racing bike doesn't work very well for hauling stuff. One of the reasons is the wheelbase is so short and the, the back end of the frame is so short that if you try to put a rack on there, even if you can do it, uh, putting the panniers on means that you're that your heel is going to hit those panniers as you're pedaling. You won't get that with most hybrids. Let me see if I can find, I'm gonna pull up one of my other presentations here because I have a slide about this. Or not. Now let's pull up this PDF, I think has it. Go to share screen again, if I can find it. All right, I can't find it. So let's try something else here because I, I just want to show you kind of what this looks like so you can keep an eye out for it. Well, that's not working either because it's giving me something else, but I have a picture. So where you mount the water bottles inside the frame is also called a brazon, and it uses the same size of bolt to mount racks. Well, I think I'm trying to do too much with the internets here. Um, and this isn't working. So if you've ever seen or your bike has mounts for a water bottle, that's called a brazon. And you would want to look for them where the back wheel attaches to the frame and somewhere below and behind the seat on the frame. Now, if your bike doesn't have them, there are some workarounds, racks that are made uh, to go with bikes that don't have brazons or a seat post collar that has the little threaded holes so that you can mount a rack. There are workarounds for that. Uh, let's get to some of these other questions. So Victoria also asks, what about the standover for a female bike when the top tube slopes, slopes downward? So that's, that's a great question. I'm gonna say a couple of things about women's bikes. Um, so what you're talking about, and I probably should put a picture in this slide deck, is um, Sorry, I'm trying to get to my full meeting here and I seem to have lost it. This is why, okay. Um, Sorry, I am just being confused by technology right now. 
So what she's talking about is the traditional women's bike or they're now called step through frames where the top tube meets the seat tube kind of halfway here in the middle, it comes down. So your the standover measurement that I gave you in the, one of the next slides in the slide deck isn't going to apply here. And this is one of the situations uh, that you have. But what you are going to need to pay attention to is that issue of the top tube length or the distance between the seat tube and the head tube or the distance between the seat tube and where the stem clamps the handlebar. If you have a bike like that and you feel like it's comfortable, I would get those measurements in inches or centimeters, take them to a shop and say, this is what I'm looking at right now and it works for me or it doesn't work for me if that's the kind of bike that you wanna buy, the so-called step through bike. You know, these were designed so that women could ride while wearing um, particularly long dresses. Uh, a lot of people still like them because they might want to wear a dress, but also they can just step through the bike and they're easier to mount and get on. Uh, that said, most, a lot of the manufacturers, particularly on the nicer end of their bikes, are offering both a women's and a men's version of that bike. But what that means, we're not talking about a totally redesigned frame that's stepped through like this. The bikes otherwise might look more or less identical, but the bike manufacturers are tweaking some things, uh, especially in terms of putting maybe a different shape of saddle on the bike. Uh, different uh, geometry or different lengths of the stem or different width on the handlebar, uh, and then tweaking the geometry of the frame so that maybe the top tubes are a little bit shorter by a centimeter or so, uh, just so that they fit typical women's body dimensions. Of course, you know, <laughs> human beings come in a wide variety of body dimensions. So this gets, this can get really complicated. But if there's a particular bike you like, like I know Jameis among a lot of their bikes, especially mountain and road, uh, will have both a men's and a women's version of, of their bikes. It's, it's a pretty cool thing the bike in, industry is doing. All right, let's go back to chat and see what else we have here. Okay, so John is asking, once we've established Sandover and reach dimensions, then zeroed in on a frame, how does a bike shop alter the steerer to reduce aggressive geometry as well as adjust the stem to bring handlebars closer or further from the rider? Um, let's see, so that the steerer is actually the top and invisible part of the fork that goes up inside the head tube or the front part of the bike. And you really can't change that. You're into buying a whole different fork where the steerer is at a different angle to the fork blades, which are the part of the fork that you can see. And that actually changes how the bike handles or, or steers how responsive or unresponsive it is. And that gets into things like um, rake and there's another dimension that have nothing to do with fitting and a lot to do with bike, how the bike handles or responds to steering. Excuse me, uh, Rich, this is John. Would, would it be correct then to say spacer? The spacer would be above that? I mean, essentially yeah, what I'm so, is- Okay, so I think, I, think you're talking about, I think you're talking about the stem. So there's a couple of different systems out there. The older system has what's called a threaded 
headset. Um, and the stem goes down inside the headset and the steerer. And you can adjust that stem up and down a little bit. But you might find that on um, some hybrids, some city bikes, or really expensive, inexpensive mountain bikes. You'll probably find it on beach cruisers. You're not going to find it on newer, halfway decent hybrids, decent mountain bikes. They've all gone to the threadless system. The threadless system, um, you know, the bike comes assembled with the steerer cut at a set length. And you can adjust the height in the, of the stem by switching the spacers around. So if the stem is all the way up and you want it down, you take some of the spacers out, you put the stem down on the rest of the spacers, and then you put those spacers that you took out on top of the stem. Um, there is a gizmo that you can buy that inserts into the stem and then you can clamp your handlebar around that. It's called a stem riser. That's really only meant for these threadless steering systems that are now on coming on most bikes. The other thing you can do is change the length of the stem uh, to make it a little bit shorter and or change the angle of the stem. Stems come in different angles and there are even some stems that are they're called adjustable. You can change the angle of the stem. I'm not a fan of the adjustable stems. I think they're heavy. They can have a little play and slop in them. Uh, but otherwise, trying to figure out what angle and what length of stem you need might be a trial and error um, kind of business. If you were working with a hybrid or a mountain bike, the other thing you can look at is does the handlebar itself have a, a bit of a rise in it because they can change that to make the ride either more upright or less upright. I mean, early mountain bikes and early hybrids just came with a flat, flat handlebar. If you were looking at a road bike, road handlebars are coming with a different reach so that from the main straight flat part to where it curves down, that section from the straight to the curve is shorter. Uh, so for an endurance bike or maybe a rider who wants um, a more upright ride or a rider like me who has a shorter torso, you might want a handlebar, a road handlebar that has a shorter reach. In fact, I. I was getting so uncomfortable on my road and touring bikes. I was like, I need to change my handlebars. I'm, I'm reaching way too far out just to rest my hands on the hoods, brake hoods. And so I invested in handlebars with a much, much shorter reach. So there, there's a lot of messing around you can do with the stem and the handlebars, but it can also be trial and error. Um, a lot of bike shops, you can go do a fitting. If you're uncomfortable, you can tell them what, what is giving you physical discomfort? Um, you know, you, you're going to pay a fee, and some shops charge more, and some shops charge less for that. All right, let's move on here. So Hannah asks if you. I, I did not say this. Uh, how many gears on average would be on an endurance or touring bike? Okay, so um, a touring bike, the, the number of gears is always going to be the number of gears on the crankset times the number of cogs or gears on the rear wheel. And on the crank set, the bike industry is kind of limited. It's either one, two, or three. Uh, on a touring bike, you're generally going to find three gears, a true touring bike. On an endurance bike, you'll, you might find three. You'll probably find two. 
Where the arms race really is at though, is on the rear cassette. When I bought my first mountain bike, actually when my mom bought my first road bike, it was five years in the back. Then six came along, people were like, oh, six. And then seven, my first mountain bike that I bought had seven years in the back. That was like 1989, 1990, somewhere in there. And then all of a sudden the bike magazines, you know, once they increased the number of gears back there, were like, seven gears are gonna ruin your knees. Well, seven gears are not going to ruin your knees. It's, it's not the number of speeds, it's the range between that top and the bottom. So they've moved on to eight. Now eight's obsolete. They moved on to nine. Nine is considered obsolete. I mean, you can still buy new bikes, like an entry-level Trek mountain bike probably has eight back there. Um, your least expensive road bikes have eight back there. But now you're seeing nine is kind of entry-level. Um, but it's the world has moved on to 10, 11, and 12. And what that means is they have to space the cogs closer and closer together. Um, they have to make the chain narrower or else they have to just like, they've even redesigned back wheels and, and the rear part of the frame to accommodate different gearing systems where you are getting 11 and 12 back there. I mean, I think 11 and 12 is useful if you're using one of those wide range adventure bike mountain bike uh, type systems. But a road racing bike with 11 gears, you're, you're hardly changing your, your pedaling cadence from one gear to another when it has 12 gears back there. Anyway, to answer your question, probably a new endurance bike, if you bought it brand new, is going to have 11, 12, maybe 10 on the back wheel times two. So it could be a 20 speed. It could be, geez, math is hard, a 22 speed. Um, it's just the number on the front on the crank set times the number of cogs on the back. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, but endur endurance bike, I think most of those are coming with a double crank with, you know, compact gearing. And then, um, cogs in the back that are probably like 11 is considered kind of standard nowadays. So that would be a 22 speed with medium to lowish gears. That was a long winded answer for probably what was a simple question. So my ear asks, are disc brakes more prone to screeching? And the answer to that question is maybe, maybe not. Uh, you do have to keep the disc rotors clean. Uh, you can clean them off with lacquer thinner or denatured alcohol. If the pads get contaminated with something like oil, that's new pad time. <coughs> but rim brakes could also screech if the pads weren't lined up correctly to the rim or if you had uh, dirt and other issues interfering with the rim and the brake pads. Uh, now I have this odd situation with a coworker who bought a Jameis adventure bike. And she was much shorter and lighter than me. And she said, Rich, my, my disc brakes are screeching. And we cleaned them, we adjust them, we checked the pads. And I got on her bike, and even though it was too small for me, and I rode it, did a little test ride, and I could not get those pads or the brakes to screech. She would get on it same day, same hour, same minute, and do the same thing and they would screech. And it was probably had something to do with her weight maybe or something. I couldn't figure it out. Uh, and I haven't talked to her in a while to see what's going on with it, but it was the weirdest thing. Uh, but no, disc brakes are not more prone to screeching. And let's see, anyway, we have some folks leaving. We are now going on eight o'clock and, um, oh, this question comes up. John is asking, I could teach a, a class on climbing trees and people would ask this question because it's a big problem. And that is what is the latest bike shop inventory? Uh, from what I understand, it's still not great. 
um, I talked to a guy at Jameis and he said, bikes are still leaving the warehouse once they come in, they don't have any inventory. Um, I walked into REI yesterday not to do bike shopping and they did have some bikes there. It was better than I've seen much of the year, but not near what they usually have. Um, and then just as an example, the Target near me does have a pretty good inventory of bikes, whereas last year they were sold out. But I'm guessing a lot of people here are not buying uh, Target type bikes. Uh, so it's getting better, but they're, it, from the sounds of it, what I'm being told is they are still a full year away from being where they want to be, where they should be. Um, that said, talk to your bike shop. And if you have your eye on a particular bike that you know is going to work for you, have them order it. Um, anyway, everybody will be getting a follow-up email uh, with a recording of this as well as some other resources that we will send you. And I appreciate everybody's time. We have kind of gone over. And uh, good luck with your bike shopping, have fun. And I hope that you uh, found this, this class uh, informative. Have a good night, everybody.